Alright y'all, this is the truth between the beef with LL Cool J and Bobby Bobcat Irvin. And I know him as DJ Bobcat. Everybody called him Bob Bobcat. The man had many names, but in case you haven't heard it from me before, I'll let y'all know. He's the world's greatest hip-hop producer that ever lived and still lived so is Bobcat somebody gonna scream primo somebody gonna scream any other ones they want I'm telling you right now you hear it from me X out all the BS he's the best producer of hip-hop Period. Period. He's number one. Don't give me Dre. Don't give me none of this other stuff. I just told you. Now you go do your research. I don't have to. <laughs> I, I, I heard him. So I already knew. What he's capable of. Now let's um, go over the facts. And these are the facts. When LL brought, well, he didn't bring him over. Russell Simmons and Lear Cohen decided to work with the LA Posse because they liked some of the work they was doing out there in the West Coast. But they was break dancing at the time. They had all these beats that they loved. So Russell Simmons wanted to bring them over to work on LL's second album, The Bad. So Bobcat and LL knew each other from working on the album. They got real tight, and and when he had uh, <clears throat> and when he had uh, mm, when he had Bob there with him, there was a whole different vibe. There was a high energy level that matched LL's energy. You know, so L like having Bobcat around because Bobcat was a writer, a producer, an arranger, even a choreographer on stage. He did a lot of different things. He had a lot of different hats. But he had the ballad for I Need Love for a song he had actually written to that beat. So he had already made that melody. And he was like, oh man. LL was like, I like that. So LL went back and started writing to it. And was like, man, I know exactly what we could do here. And once they put the song together and made I Need Love and all that. He was an instant hit. And once Bobcat became an instant hit, it was only natural that he go ahead and um, you know and get a big deal with Def Jam. So what he did was he got with um, with Russell Simmons and they had a promotion for I Need Love. The LL Cool J wanted him to be there. And he had uh, this R&B singer named uh, Michelle Jones. She was there, and uh, they were on. Uh, she was doing some publishing work. She had did a lot of stuff for like Blender, the magazine, and so they went there and they had an interview and they talked to uh, you know Blender and uh, LL. Was, that was like very rare that like some of the rap got in the blender and you know he helped set that up Bobcat did so LL said man you need to come with me on the tour we're going to go on the Def Jam tour now that tour had Salt and Pepper like NWA was actually on the tour for a minute KRS One Houdini I mean every rapper was on that tour Eric B and Rakim you know, I'm like, shoot. 
Stats of Sonic, but LL Cool J was the headliner of the act. Like, he closes the show. So, doing the Def Jam tour and everything else, it became one of the biggest tours of all time at that time, doing tens of millions of dollars. Like, I think they did about 20 or 30 million all in sales. He decides, okay, well, let's go ahead, Bobcat. Like, you know, Russell Simmons, Leon Cohen, you know, they're going to sign me to a deal while I work exclusively with them. And they're like, yeah, sure, Bob. You know, you did a great work here. We love what you're doing. Here's your deal. He's like, what? So, he, uh, he was approached by Clive Davis at Arista Records. And Clive Davis told him, what did they offer you? And don't lie. And he's like, oh, they offered me this. Because Clive Davis saw what he was doing production-wise and said, look, you were writing, producing, and he's like, I'm going to start going into the rap field. And he said, what I want to do is I'm seeing how big this thing is becoming. I want you to headline it. And Eddie Murphy's brother, who happened to be Vernon Lynch, and Bobcat's brother, formed a group called K-9 Posse. <laughs> and Bobcat wrote the song, Ain't Nothing To It But To Do It. And that's been like one of the biggest classic songs on there. But and then it's like, Bobcat's writing all these songs for his brother and them to rap. And he was trying to bring K-9 Posse over to Def Jam. And Russell Simmons then was like, this is whack. But Eddie Murphy put the money up with Clyde Davis and said, Eddie didn't want nothing to do with it, really. Eddie was like, I'm doing this for my brother. So here's the money. <laughs> Charlie Charlie Murphy... You in charge of Vernon. You gonna that's the youngest brother, so he's like, Well you Charlie, you in charge of Vernon. You deal with that. So Charlie Murphy was basically running it was like Murphy Eddie Murphy or Murphy's prom promotions or whatever. Charlie Murphy was in charge of it. And the little brother Vernon was gonna be this rap star. And it was gonna have the biggest song in the world and all this stuff. So Eddie was like, Charlie you get him to do it. I gotta focus on my movies. <laughs> so Charlie Murphy get in there and start working with him, managing him. Look, I ain't gonna go for none of that. Okay, you lay your songs and, and you're done. Okay, Vernon? Eddie gave me the money. <laughs> I'm gonna pay everybody else, including this Bobcat. I don't know him. But I'm a pan. Him and his brother. And we're going to split this money up. And we're going to get paid. And we're going to make a lot of records. And we're going to have a lot of women. we're going to get a lot of party. And I want to be around for all that. <laughs> so Charlie Murphy. So Charlie was involved with all of that proceedings. And when it was said and done. At the end of it. The whole album basically is talking about Def Jam and a uh, hard cool with this beat is military. He's on there, Def Jam, what's that, a weak cut? <laughs> so they like taking shots at Def Jam, which is really Bobcat taking shots at Def Jam for not signing K9 Posse. <laughs> so After the success of K9 Posse, Bobcat, they told him, like, man, you're a good writer. We, uh, we're going to put you with uh, Mitchell Cohen. And he's like, we want you to be the face because you already been known for being with LL Cool J. We're going to get you to make a record. Cat got your tongue. And on the Cat Got Your Tongue album, Bobcat is rapping about LL Cool J, 
and they realize Bobcat can't rap. <laughs> he can write a rap record, but he should not be rapping. The album went doo doo, and he went back to the West Coast doing work with King T and everybody else. Now, LL Cool J came in the scene and was like, look, man, after all these years, after they did Walking with a Panther without him, he's like, look, man, I got to bring my boy back. You know, they've been fighting over money and haven't been speaking. And he was like, let me bring Bobcat back to the fold because he felt he was old money and LL didn't stick up for him with Def Jam and it was just crazy you know LL Cool J is not the president of the Def Jam and so back then in the 80's if you was a big artist they basically thought that was your label when his problems really was Lear Cohen, Russell Simmons and everybody else he blamed LL Cool J like man L, you, I work for you you supposed to get my money you know it's, so it's one of those type of situations so after that, you know, he's doing all this work. LL telling him, look, man, I need you to come back. Man, let's get this thing going. You know, let's get this um, track I got here is for the Mama Said Knock You Out. So I want to get back to working with you. So he did the Mama Said Knock You Out joint. And ever since then, they were back in good graces. Put Bobcat back on that, and then um, he did 14 shots to the dome, and was like, "Look, man, my father is crazy. He was firing everybody. He was like, and he's like, man, I want you to do my album, work on my album, my new one, 14 shots to the dome. I'm bringing you back." And. He brought him back, 14 shots to the dome, didn't do what they thought it was going to do, especially for an LL Cool J record. For any other artist, it would have been okay, but this is LL Cool J. When you sell like 900000 that wasn't, at that time, an LL Cool J, especially coming out the, off of Mama Said Knock You Out success. So, Bobcat did like five songs on the album and then you know they was cool but he got paid you know what I'm saying so after that LL went a whole new approach a whole new sound so he wasn't using Bobcat no more but they squared away you know they went ahead and uh did you know patched up the beef that they had but for those who didn't know LL Cool J and that guy was like the same type of dude and by cut creator who really was his old school DJ that he was showing loyalty to because he was around he had a job he had a nine to five so it was he'll get off and do some sets and that's why L needed Bobcat around more because you know cut creator had a full-time job until they started performing and L was paying him he was able to like put the job on hold when he'd go on tour and stuff with LL, but you know, he was a family man and and he was his DJ and cut creator. Even though they had to do the song, Bobcat was the one doing all the scratching on the song. Cause even though Cut Creator was good, he wasn't Bobcat good. <laughs> like Bobcat, a lot of people thought Bobcat was Cut Creator. They was like, I thought it was him. No. Cut Creator right there. <laughs> Bobcat is his own DJ. But he had the energy level. You know, that that went with the style of what they was going for. But remember what I told you. He's the number one and best DJ, rapper, whatever you want to call it, producer, whatever, in rap history. Bobcat. I'm out.